Hey guys, welcome to The Edge Zone. This is Mike Wolfert, your host, and I just wanted to say thanks for listening. I hope that you're enjoying this offering. We want it to be really valuable and inspiring for you, and we want your participation. Uh, We don't have any ads on this podcast, and we just ask that you subscribe and help other people who you think would be interested in this find the podcast. So if you can share it on any social media that you like, that would be super helpful to us, and we'd really appreciate it. You can get involved in the discussion by joining the Facebook group Edge Zone Podcast, and you can send us an email at contact at edgezonepodcast.com, and periodically we'll do a show where we review questions and give our thoughts and responses. Thanks so much. Enjoy. So today I'm being joined by Heather Ray. And I'm actually just getting to know Heather, but last week I had the pleasure of having my first VR experience. And um, Heather is a visionary transformative experience designer, and I'm looking forward to learning a little bit more about what that looks like. Um, And she works for and co-founded Andromeda Entertainment. She's from New York. It's a background in architecture and psychology. That's very interesting to combine those two fields, by the way. And uh, she's passionate about creating spaces aimed at giving visitors their best shot at a transformative experience. So cool to look at spaces and structures and events from that viewpoint of, is this going to be transformative somehow? So Heather, thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I guess it was a little more than a week ago, I went over to the Andromeda headquarters and I put on my first VR set. Well, actually throughout the night, I think I tried three different VR sets. Um, But I would say that the most impactful experience that I had that night was playing the game that, um, that your company designed. And what was the name of that one again? That's called Sound Self. Sound Self. Okay, cool. Uh, this is an incredible experience, and I've I've spent a lot of time playing video games, and I've never had an experience like this. And I've also spent a lot of time meditating, and I've never had an experience like this. And some background for people: um, although I've spent a lot of time trying to meditate, I'm not very good at just sitting still and focusing on my breath. I have more success with moving meditations typically. And what I found really cool about this game was how immersive it was and how easy it was for me to block out all other thought. I was completely focused and um, I'll just try to explain a little bit, although I know I won't be able to capture the full experience. You start, well, you play the game laying down, first of all, and the bed has haptics, which means that it's vibrating, it's moving, it feels more immersive, um, sort of takes care of some of the physical sensations. And you start laying down at the base of a tree and a voice is guiding you into deep breath. And I will say I've been instructed through meditation many times and it is possible to uh, sort of get really distracted by the guide. And I didn't feel that way at all about this guide. And she got me focused on my breath and then asked us to start toning. And at first I was a little bit self-conscious because I'm like, rigged up with these big headphones on and the VR goggles in front of me and I'm laying down and I'm imagining like other people in the room are going to hear me toning and this is kind of weird. But I made it through that block and once I started and felt the haptics in the bed and the game started to play back my own tones with reverb and some pitch modulation. So it was almost like I was harmonizing with myself. I completely lost all self-consciousness about it and was just on a wild mindfulness ride, I would say. Uh And about 10 minutes in, I had no idea how long it had been. It could have been an hour. It could have been five minutes. I completely lost sense of time. Uh, I wasn't worried about anything that happened earlier in the day or anything that was going to happen in the future. And I started to experience like, something that I've only experienced um, in extreme states of bliss where my eyes are literally going out of focus and starting to roll back into my head. And um, 
Yeah. And then, yeah, you, you brought me out of the experience about 20 minutes in, you said, but I had no idea how long it had been. And I think I would have been even more immersed and even more impacted by this experience if I wasn't like doing research for a podcast. Cause there was a part of my brain that was like, I have to remember and maybe possibly describe this. Um, so I didn't completely untether, but I definitely could have, um, and then I felt lasting experiences later that night. I felt really calm, really peaceful, really present. And the next day and throughout the week since doing that, I've actually remembered to breathe and even tone as I'm driving for you know 30 minutes sometimes or whatever it is. And so uh, one session of the game has helped me to stay more committed to a mindfulness practice throughout the week. So I thought that was really cool. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, it seems like that's a pretty standard experience with sound self. Even one playthrough does have lasting effects. Um, uh, I've heard everything from this was just like DMT to, Oh my God, I met God in there. Mm. <laughs> that's cool. Have, have you been playing this game for a while or? Um, yes, I've been involved since the very beginning um, since my co-founder at Andromeda, Robin Arnott um, is his name, um, was, at a, was at Burning Man in 2012 and had his first oneness experience on a small dose of LSD. <laughs> he found himself uh, amid a group ohm inside of a dome, and the LSD assisted him in seeing the voices rise up around him. And when his voice joined in, the voices kind of coalesced into a mandala of light in the center of the dome. And he felt so inspired by this uh, sort of disembodied sense of self and connection with the other people around him that being a game designer, he thought to himself, geez, I bet I could make this accessible to everyone using digital tools. And so he just started and the very first prototype actually worked. And what do you mean when you say it actually worked? What was your experience when you tried it? Uh, my experience was pretty interesting because I have always had a really uh, intense relationship with my voice. As soon as I could become aware of it while I was speaking, it would cause me to kind of pull back to myself and not want to talk because I didn't like the sound of it. Um, hearing it recorded was always awful, like torture. Um, and the first time I ever played, there was other people there. And I wasn't in VR. I was just standing in front of a microphone looking at a screen. Mm. Um, and I started to sweat immediately as soon as I started making sounds other people could hear. <laughs> um, but a few breaths in, the, you know, the feedback, uh, both the visual and the audio feedback sort of lulled me into the sense of um, s like disconnection from the sound. Like it wasn't really me, but but it was. Um, and so that was a little bit uncomfortable for me. But the next time I played through it, I didn't have that sense of anxiety um, mm -hmm. about the sound of my voice. And um, fast forward a couple of years and I was like singing the song that was stuck in my head to other people out loud. Um, so mm -hmm. it really helped to transform my relationship to my voice, but it also made me a much more effective meditator. I, I think a lot of Westerners have the same problem is that we don't have a lot of uh, extra time and discipline to, you know, get the effects of spending 10 years on the mountains with the monks and practicing every day. Um, so we really want meditation to come easier than it does. And so this is a bit of a shortcut and I feel really proud to be involved in it. I've been involved since the genesis of it. Yeah, it's interesting. I think we're all always looking for a shortcut. And especially in the modern day culture, you know, we're all trying to hack life somehow or find the, the cheat codes. And I would say that that is pretty much what I experienced with this game where there was a time where I was doing Kundalini yoga teacher training and I was waking up at 4.30 in the morning and we would do these two hour practices. So you're waking up completely fresh. You know, there's very little on your mind because you've just woken up and you go through this whole yoga sequence and then there's a, a lot of chanting at the end. You sit around and you chant and then you lay down for a while and do Shavasana. Yeah. And maybe once every 10 practices of sadhana, I would have as deep of an experience as I had through this game. And you think about how much more energy I'm putting into it to get those results 
versus this game. Uh, of course, the there is hardware and software and everything that you have to acquire, but mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's so amazing to have this shorter path up the mountain. And I'm really excited about it. I'm really excited about people who would try meditation and get discouraged by the slow progress or by all of the distractions, especially as you're first trying to sort of tame the monkey mind uh, to be able to step into it with this tool and really um, and not give up or shy away or feel like they're not good enough at it to meditate. Yeah, it can be a real challenge to the ego to try something like that and feel not good at it. Yeah, it's so funny too, because meditation is like, um, it's such a personal journey. And yet that voice that's like, almost making it a competition is always there. You know, there's no really, it's so hard to turn that off. And I found that even in practicing yoga, I was like slightly competitive about yoga. (laughs) I find competitive meditation to be very compelling. I don't know if you've ever heard of meditation (laughs) deathmatch. No, I haven't. (laughs) Tell me about it. This is an Austin project as well. Some of my friends, neuroscientists and mystics of all kinds came together to create a sort of a, (laughs) <laughs> it's a tongue in cheek kind of thing. Um, but they do, they put you in like a dome with uh, glowing platforms under you and they, two people at a time with EEGs on their head, just meditate. And they're supposed to, you know, get a better score than the other player while the MC is heckling them and they're playing death metal <laughs> and they're running around inside the dome and getting in your face. And, uh, you know, after playing sound cell for a number of years, I tried this and immediately got the world record. Like it was wow. no problem for me to just tune out uh, or allow in, which is really more what I was doing was allowing in all of the input that they were giving me and just allowing it to be equal. <laughs> That's interesting. Wow. I think sounds, that sounds did like, that for me. <laughs> that sounds like an amazing project. And yeah, kudos to being able to surrender to the distractions and kind of integrate it into the mindfulness. I definitely need to work on that with all of the things that are always going on, especially because I have three kids. So like things crazy sometimes in the house and you just have to stay calm, be like, they're having fun. It's okay. So maybe sound self can help me be a better parent. Yeah. So how long, I think, did you say you've been playing sound self for seven years? Um, or a version of it? The, yeah. The first working prototype happened in early 2013. I want to say. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. So seven so, years yeah. and six years, I guess. And was that the first time that you thought about video games from a mindfulness perspective or from flow states? Absolutely. Yeah. And then when you did start thinking about video games from that perspective, do you feel like retrospectively your relationship with video games before was at all related to mindfulness or flow states? Uh, I think so. I think some of the things that I really enjoyed about Salila, like Sonic the Hedgehog when I was growing up was one of my favorites, Um, kind of at the edge of your, you know, your ability and also you're really enjoying yourself. Um, I realized that I was constantly reaching flow states while playing something like Sonic the Hedgehog or even back to Mario Brothers when I was really young. So that was a fascinating thing to discover that I was already you know, accessing flow. Yeah. And so now you're more kind of deliberate or aware of it. It's more in the conscious frame of mind. So are you compelled to seek mindfulness through video games every day or how often do you use that tool? Um, I use sound self a lot less frequently than I used to. Um, Mm. Now that it's kind of in my home, uh, and I have access to it all day long, every day. For some reason, it's um, less necessary for me. I think I've gotten to a point where it's not difficult for me to reach state, and I can just sit with my eyes closed for five minutes and feel very refreshed and centered. So less so with um, Sound Cell, for example, but one of the other games, our most recently um, published game, is Audio Trip. It's mm. available in early access on Steam, and it is... Uh, a dance flow game. And that one I try to use every single day because I feel like, uh, like you said, moving meditations have always been kind of more my jam than sitting still. And uh, the choreographer on that, uh, Ashley, is a really good dancer. And uh, the love of dance comes through in the choreography. So 
you know, putting my body into the places where she would put her body feels amazing. And I, I crave it. And mm. it's the only reason I do cardio every day for sure. <laughs> Never would do that otherwise. Yeah, that's really cool. I like a couple things about that one that you actually personally know the designer and have like a connection to the person who created this experience. Um, thinking about being able to make up a dance and then give it to someone else in game form and have them do that dance is a really fun idea to me. And like learning about someone through doing their dance. That's yeah. really neat. Yeah. And this game is uh, working on a feature called the choreographer where any player can craft a choreography for their friends to play. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. <laughs> that is so fun. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you're less interested or you're, you're using these games less for mindfulness and flow at this point and more just doing what's fun and appealing to you. So it's not like um, like something that you're like addicted to or like, oh man, if I don't get my, my sound self in, then I'm just not going to have a good day. No, it definitely doesn't feel that way. It's not like a, a need or uh, a crutch. Like I can't get to state without it. That's a meditative state. I just shorten it to get to state because that's how I think of it. But um, yeah, I don't feel like it's a crutch and it's not a need. It actually like helped reinforce those neural pathways to meditative state. Um, so that I don't really need it as much anymore, but it was definitely something that got me there mm. quickly. And I guess that's, I guess that's something that I, that we should talk about with people is that, you know, this will be a tool to get you to a place where you don't need it anymore. We don't want you to be dependent on this. Yeah. It's almost like you're setting these pathways, these grooves in the mind so that you can just get there really fast. But I'm curious, did you notice like at what point that started to happen since you've been practicing for seven years in this way? Um, I didn't specific? notice because I don't think I was trying to meditate without it necessarily until I, uh, let's see, I don't even know when I started actively trying to sit for meditations. Um, so I couldn't really tell you when I noticed, but um, I didn't have a lot of trouble when I sat down and closed my eyes, I was there. Yeah. And and when you just sit and meditate, do you tone at all or make any sounds or are you just being quiet? Uh, I do both, you know, uh, it depends on how I'm feeling. If I really need a boost and um, something to stimulate, like the toning really stimulates the vagus nerve. So if I'm feeling um, edgy or upset about something, the toning really, really helps mm. clear up stuck energy and stuff like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And for, for anyone who's listening, who doesn't know what I'm talking about with toning, you're just humming and it can be at any pitch, whatever's comfortable for you. You don't have to try to sing a specific note or do anything that sounds a certain way for anyone else. It's just making vibration with your exhale. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, yeah. And I wanted to make a quick distinction here because we're talking about two things. We're talking about meditative state and flow state. And I think mm -hmm. that they're a little bit different, but I'm curious to know, where do you kind of draw the line between those two things? That's really tough. Um, I, they're so related. Like you could be in a flow state that's more or less meditative, I think, um, with more of like, uh, so for example, when I do work, you know, work-related processes, office-related things where I have to like manage data, um, I tend to make it into a process that's easily repeatable physically so that I can um, get into a flow that's physical with my work, mm -hmm. even if it's just data entry, you know? Um, so I think that's a kind of meditation. It's a kind of moving meditation when you do that. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And it's, yeah, I think to build upon what you're saying, I feel like the meditative state is, um, it's like more calm, more just like centered and, you know, not, feeling very reactive to the emotions like you've got time in between receiving stimulus and what you choose to do about it. And flow state is like a higher gear where you're so engaged that um, you're almost reacting without even thought or consideration. You're just go, go, go. Yeah. And there's a, a major sort of distortion of reality in that state. Mm-hmm. Whereas meditation, it's like things are still normal. You just feel different. <laughs> yeah. 
in meditation being um, mostly marked by internal stillness, I would say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like a quiet, calm sense, as opposed to like the state of general anxiety that I've gone through most of my life in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> So what's the most interesting out there game related VR related experience you've had to date? Oh, okay. So this is uh there's a really cool uh game, I guess you can call it a game, um uh, in VR called The Wave, which is a social creative platform. Um it looks a bit like Burning Man at Night. That's the setting is like a dark desert. And it's full of all of these digital art pieces that people have created that are um, musical in some way and they're interactive. So you can kind of wander and find something to play with. And there's also, you know, your home cave where you can throw a party and you can create your own things and you can invite and you can meet other people. And so we went to uh, to play that the other night in a, um, a party they were throwing that was uh, specifically like Burning Man, Burning Man Party, <laughs> unsanctioned by Burning Man. <laughs> um, and I met someone in there that's from Austin <laughs> that I actually knew. And I was probably the only one in the room that I was in that was um, using the flow toys that are in the game to dance with. Um, so people started coming up to me to try to talk to me and I couldn't hear anybody at first. And then I realized you had to get very close to them. Um, at which point I asked you know, what, what the guy's name was. And he told me, and I, I realized that I knew him. So that was really strange. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when you meet people in the game, are you guys wearing like avatars or is it somehow an image of what you actually look like? Yeah, no, they're avatars and they're kind of generic. They have like a different, a few different body shapes and then a few different head shapes. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, pretty anonymous. Your screen name is above your head, but that doesn't really tell anybody anything. Do you think that eventually they'll have like uh, almost like a camera on your face that basically is projecting what's actually happening with your face into the avatar situation? Yes. I can't remember who's making it, but uh, I know that there's already a little device that you can like strap to your chest. So the camera is looking at your face and your avatar will make exactly your facial expressions and speak with your voice with, you know, the animated mouth. Uh, I saw it at, I want to say, E3 or some video game conference that I was at recently where a guy was just walking around with a screen hanging around his chest and a camera pointed at his face and his avatar was just, it looked just like him, but it wasn't like a, you know, it was a cartoon version of him. Really cool, really cool stuff. Yeah, that's super neat. So you're, you basically went to a, on a digital party. Yeah. And we're able to dance and we're able to use flow toys and we're able to meet people and synchronistically ran into someone that you already know of all the yep. people who might have crossed your path. <laughs> right. Of the thousands of people that were in there, I bumped into somebody that I know from my hometown. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So why did you guys choose to call the company? I'm always interested in business names. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's something that I thought long and hard about for my business and eventually just had to choose something that felt right. So I'm curious what your process was like choosing the name of your company, Andromeda, and why you guys settled on that. Uh, It's a funny story. I was actually out of town when the name change happened, so I wasn't a part of that process. But from what I can gather, um, (laughs) Andromeda being our closest neighbor, our closest galactic neighbor, it it is coming towards us. Mm -hmm. Um, So in the future, Andromeda and the Milky Way will merge into a single new galaxy. And um, I think my team was inspired by the sense that we're driving this huge change, this identity shaking change in the games industry. Hmm. I like that. That's very cool, man. That's nuts to think about two galaxies colliding like that. Is it galaxies or two? Yeah. Two galaxies. Yeah. Whoa. And you know, we think of ourselves as the intersection between spirituality and technology. We really want to be able to tie these things together for the benefit of the future of humanity. And mm-hmm. so this is like two galaxies colliding. And the imagery just really struck me when somebody explained it to me that way. I got back home and they were like, the new company is named Andromeda. And I was like, oh, why? Yeah, that's <laughs> really cool. Thanks, guys. Good call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good thing they had a good reason. Yep. <laughs> You justify it. (laughs) (laughs) So what's it like to be a game developer? I kind of 
that, you know, I feel like growing up playing video games, I've always idolized that to be the one who makes the game. Uh, but I'm curious if, if it's sort of just the same as other jobs that you've done or if it's really <laughs> something special. This is an interesting question because I am not a game developer. <laughs> ah, I can gotcha. I can edit code a little bit, which I do for our website, but I don't write code and I've never developed a game. Um, I fell totally ass backwards into this industry um, via my friend Robin Arnott, who's the designer of SoundSelf. Um, <laughs> as a space maker, I was helping him set up booths at trade shows and conferences and festivals um, mm-hmm. to help kind of make a liminal space between the booming buzzing chaos of the conference and the inner stillness that we want you to experience in sound self. Mm. Um, so the first time I did that was at Burning Man, um, in 2013, he asked me to design a theater for multiplayer use. It was going to be in deep playa. It was a gigantic project. I worked full time on it. And ever since that, that Burning Man, he's asked me to please come along and do the show with him. And that went on for years until he wanted to start Andromeda and he's like, I couldn't do this without you. Um, but it's really strange because I have never really been interested in working in tech and I have never really been that much of a gamer. I mean, I've played games, I've always played games, but um, it wasn't my passion and I didn't think that it was something that I would find myself in, but it seems like a really good fit as far as space making goes. Um, I can help these things shine and these experiences shine in the way that they deserve to and make people feel comfortable enough to have a heart opening experience at mm-hmm. like a game conference, which is pretty impressive. Yeah. That's, there's two things that really come up for me there. One of them is when I was in the VR and when I would take the headset off and I'd be back in the room that we were in, um, it was like space shrunk back down to the, to the reality of the size of the room. And it struck me that, people who are into architecture are going to be able to create stuff in VR that they never would be able to build physically in the real world. So it expands that craft into more of a uh, conceptual realm and really kind of unleashes creativity in a way. And then when you're talking about creating a booth amongst a chaotic scene, it sort of makes me think about when there's like a massage therapist in the grocery store or like in a Whole Foods or whatever, and how <laughs> it's like a nice idea, but it's kind of hard to relax. Like there's people walking by and they see you, and like, you know, it's kind of weird. Um, so I could definitely yeah. see the challenge in being like, come in here, relax, don't worry about everything else going on around you. Mm-hmm. Come and sit with me on my cushion, and I'll serve you some tea, and then I'll put you in this VR experience, and you'll come out feeling like a new person. It's happened hundreds of times. Yeah, that sounds pretty fulfilling to be able to just pluck someone out of the cloud, uh, out of the crowd, the cloud crowd, <laughs> and uh, and then send them back a little bit different. And it then is to to imagine those ripple effects of them feeling different and behaving differently, kind of transferring into their family a little bit and into their friends. Yeah. So. I'm so curious about right livelihood and you're saying that this job feels like a good fit for you. Are you familiar with the concept of right livelihood? Um, Go ahead and explain it to me. Sure. So it's basically this idea that everyone wants, you know, we spend so much of our life working that we all want our work to be meaningful and fulfilling and to wake up every day excited to do it, you know, passionate about it. And I think for a lot of folks, it's important to have some sort of a greater mission or vision and I definitely see that behind the work that you're doing. And uh, and I also feel like it's a practice, like constantly adjusting to make sure that you're staying in your right livelihood. Um, like it's easy for to stay in the same job, but to allow that job to sort of shift off the path. Um, so I'm curious if you feel like you're doing your right livelihood and um, and sort of if you have any practices to make sure that you stay on track. Uh, yes, I feel like... Um, just being in the flow and having this sort of synchronously play out and falling into this role in this company has been a huge growth point for me. I'm always doing things that I've never done before. Um, and that, you know, I, I always imagined myself, my career would be something that I knew I was good at, that I could just jump into and kick ass and be amazing. And um, that doesn't really challenge me much. Once I started doing this, I realized that I really need to be challenged. I really need to 
um, be constantly invigorated by, ooh, how do I even do that? This is something that I need to do that I feel really compelled to do for my company, but how now I have like this mission to learn something new. And I think that's right up my alley. It's exactly what I need to be doing and it's very fulfilling. So yeah. Mm. Do you feel like there's a company culture like that among you guys where people are just willing to figure stuff out or are you, are there like a few people within the company who are kind of the go-getters like that? Um, No, everybody is willing to lean into what they need to learn. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. I'm very excited about learning new stuff in our company. Yeah. I love the confidence that you gain from taking on that mindset where you know that if you just devote enough time to it, you'll figure it out. Like um, five years ago or six or seven years ago when I was first starting the company that I run, I didn't know how to do very many things uh, as far as like fixing plumbing or building a deck or this or that. And I've learned so much along the way and it's gotten to the point where if something in my house breaks, I know I can figure it out. It might take me an extra trip to the hardware store, but I've got that, the confidence to just say, all right, I can figure out how this works and I can fix it. Yeah. I think that's a special gift of our generation Mm. (laughs) and the generations that have followed us. (laughs) Well, it seems like YouTube has opened up a lot in that regard. And then, you know, like I've learned a ton of stuff from YouTube and, um, and then the, like what it's replacing is more of a um, mentorship system. Mm hmm. And I think that's yeah. still really valuable too for deeper learning. Like you don't have to be fully specialized and you don't have to go under the wing of someone else who's fully specialized in order to learn a skill. And I think that's definitely freeing. Yeah. And you don't need to be a plumber to fix your kitchen sink either. Just like you don't need to be a monk to learn to meditate. Yeah. So I'm hoping that we can become more just rounded people in that regard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think technology is really helping us do that, become more rounded more worldly in general as well. Yeah. And I've, I've personally got this like tense relationship with technology, whereas obviously I use it every day, all day. And at the same time, there's a part of me that wants us to go back to this like agrarian society where people are growing their own food and where people are more connected to nature. Cause I think that's an important element of being human as well. And so I'm always trying to find the balance between uh, the use of technology and appropriate technology and not getting so disconnected from our roots and from our, uh, our natural state, which I guess is debatable. You know, it's like, like if we are part of nature and then we produce technology, well, that is natural. Um, but I think it's really cool that, that the, yeah, <laughs> that the games that you're making are related to state shift. Yeah. That we're, trying to kind of get people's brains to be more plastic. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Able to shift back and forth between that. Like I'm immersed in technology and I'm answering emails, but I'm still calm and grounded. And when it's time to stop working, I can shut that off and go do X or whatever, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And with these really active uh, VR games, like, Like Audio Trip, for example, you can be totally immersed in a video game and you're still in your body and doing something that's physically good for you, which is a brand new dichotomy. Yeah, it was amazing how much exercise I got. And I think I was actually kind of sore the next day um, from I only played two games and um, I can't remember the name of one of them. I know one of them was the Star Wars game, which was super fun. And I played that on the wireless uh, VR set. Yep. And so that was cool. There were moments where I was definitely feeling like I, and there were other moments where I felt very clumsy, but that was fun too. Um, you looked like a real Jedi from the outside, by the way. <laughs> Thanks for saying that. <laughs> um, and then the other game that I played, I, uh, maybe you'll remember the name of it because you said that you play it pretty often <clears throat> where there's a song and you're dancing kind of, but you're also trying to hit these little targets. Yeah, that one's called Audio Trip. That's the one we just published. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Oh, that's your game too. Awesome. I loved that game. That was so fun. Yeah. It's the most fun I've ever had in VR. It's a blast. (laughs) Yeah. And I was sweating. I was after like five minutes of that game, I was sweating because you're in these like low stances. If you've ever done martial arts or anyone listening has, it's like horse stance where like your thighs are almost uh, parallel to the floor and you're like bending all around and waving your arms up. And 
I don't think I was quite to the level where I actually felt like I was dancing. I was more like herky jerky. Um, but I could imagine after, after playing the songs a few times, you'd start to find the flow in there. That's what it is. It just takes a few playthroughs um, to stop kind of reacting to the moment that is already here and start like preparing your body for the, the goals that are coming toward you. Um, you know what I mean? So you can start to find your flow between the notes instead of just moving your hand to the next one. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like you split your mind into two parts and there's the part that's managing the present moment, but there's a large amount of your focus is actually on what's next, but it doesn't feel like a strain. Right. Yeah. And it's very challenging. It never stops being challenging somehow. Well, and I think that's an interesting thing about flow state is that actually you need to be challenged uh, pretty drastically to get there. Yeah. Right. So as a company of people, and how many people do you work with, by the way? That's a tough question because of the contractor thing. Um, we have one, two, three, four, I would say four full-time employees and a handful of contractors, uh, I want to oh. say. Um six maybe sure. yeah, it's a <laughs> so right team. around 10 11 people yeah so i'm so curious because as a company working on games that are specifically related to flow states and especially with it being kind of all the rage in silicon valley for companies to try to induce flow states somehow uh, within the working environment especially with coding and things like this um do you feel like people are specifically or like there's a company culture of trying to work in more of a flow state? Yeah, there definitely is. Um, we run something called a holacracy. So it's a self-management system. We have kind of a regimented style of meeting where we have particular kinds of inputs and particular kinds of outputs. And we start every meeting by um, checking in with each other about our current emotional states and then doing some deep breathing, maybe some toning together just to get us kind of synced um, aware of where each one of us is at um, before we start to process tensions together. And uh, we have a culture obviously of just bringing our whole self to work um, and understanding that everybody's got challenges at home. Everybody's got their own emotional stuff going on and that is who we really are. And we're not trying to put some part of ourselves away in order to be present at work, which I find so refreshing. <laughs> and I think everybody who works with us really finds it refreshing. Yeah. I can definitely remember working at jobs where I felt like I couldn't be myself and it's really tiring. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I think for people to imagine a company that produces games and does so in flow state, I could sort of imagine like, uh, you know, you guys are all in this room and there's like cool music playing and like people can get up and exercise when they want to and, you know, maybe some, <laughs> yes, that some is awesome perfect. food available. Yep, I always have fresh fruit. The water cooler has really cold water. We have a really cool device that uh, John, one of our... Uh, or he's our CFO, our chief financial officer, has a vibro pad that you can stand on. It vibrates your whole body. So if you start to feel tense or overly energetic, you stand on this thing and it just shakes the shit out of you. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, we have play with a lot of weird tech and um, work is very much like play for us. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Um, so you guys are doing a good job of managing your own workspace. Do you think you'll ever develop a game or a system that people that other companies can adopt that will help them to both enjoy and be more productive at work? Cause I would love that. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I don't know as far as like digital experiences go, like a VR experience or some kind of a game. Um, huh. That's a good question. I don't know. Um, I, I do know that, you know, the, like I said, the holacracy that we, that we run is a, it's a kind of a game um, sure. because of the meeting style. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, there is already a system that makes working more enjoyable and more productive. I would recommend people look into that. The, uh, the founder of holacracy, um, Robert, Robert. Hmm. I can't think of his name. Maybe you should cut this out. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> he lives in Austin anyway. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. How do you, how do you, do you know how do you spell how holacracy? I'm a terrible speller. Yeah. It's H O L A C R A C Y. Cool. I'll Brian Robertson. Out. His name is Brian Robertson. 
Ryan Robertson, Austinite Holacracy. Yeah, so rather than trying to like play some special digital experience while you work, you're saying really what it comes down to is management and doing things just from a more human, authentic place and connecting with each other as humans as well as as sort of components and team members of this greater thing that's that has specific goals and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. It's like we're playing a game together and the game output the win state is we publish games <laughs> right <laughs> yeah and sometimes you can get so focused on the goal when you know it's not worth ex- uh, sacrificing the experience of we're all human and we're all here and we can have a, at least a little bit of fun every day um, but I know I'm guilty of being like oh we've got this goal and we have to sacrifice the present moment in order to meet this goal but if you, what I found is if you do that too much, it becomes your regular just mode of operation. And it gets yeah, and you're just reacting. In. Yeah. And you're just like, there's always another goal. There's going to be another goal. Um, so I'm curious now that I've tried VR, I'm curious about how this is going to spread into our overall lives and what your thoughts are since you've kind of been in this space for a while, thinking about it, um, kind of like the transition of smartphones becoming more ubiquitous. Do you think something similar is going to happen with VR? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think the evidence is like everywhere in sci-fi. If you like sci-fi, I think the evidence is everywhere that this will become ubiquitous because we're just itching for it. And I would give it 10 years or less before this is like, everyone has a reason to use it once a day. Mm. Um, the hardware is becoming more accessible and cheaper and smaller and requiring less uh, technical savvy to Mm -hmm. use. Um, The games that are available are getting more and more polished. And um, yeah, I I definitely see it becoming ubiquitous. Yeah. Do you think that people will be carrying around glasses that can do VR and also like uh, what is it? A- AR, I guess, alternate reality, reality. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I cannot imagine the future doesn't contain that. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the, currently, what is there? There's like Google Glass. I don't know if that's what it's called anymore, but it was like a, a headset that was relatively small and kind of had a projected display on the on the glasses. And if that was, I mean, that was years ago that that came out. It didn't take off at the time, but. I think we're we're getting there. I think that's right around the corner for sure. Yeah, I just typed it in real quick and you were right. It is Google Glass and they're like a thousand dollar pair of glasses that can <laughs> mm-hmm. function as a screen, mm-hmm. I guess. Okay, yeah. So people will be wearing glasses, walking around. And I guess just for the audience, the difference between VR and AR, VR, you're in a virtual space and in AR, you know, you could be walking around and things could be superimposed over what you're seeing like information about what you're looking at or you know things like this yeah which Which i think also uh, all over sci-fi you see these heads up displays in various movies where uh let's see what's the one i'm thinking of the terminator where the terminator can look at a person and know who they are and how they're aligned and all that stuff yeah i think that's definitely in the future yeah, and it's interesting that so much of our, um, like you just brought up the Terminator, so much of our future tech reference is from like a cautionary standpoint or like this is what could happen if, you know, if things get out of hand. Mm-hmm. Um, are you someone who loses sleep over the idea of AI? No. No, nah, not worried <laughs> about it. Why not? I just, I mean, I don't think it's worth me personally worrying about. I don't have any control over those people who are trying to develop that stuff. Um, I, I kind of just hope in, in my heart that they are, if they have these worries and that they're staying up at night thinking about it, doesn't do me any good to worry about it. So I try not to. Spoken like a practice meditator. <laughs> um, there's like a, a flow chart thing, like, uh, um, am I worried about something? Yes. And then you go down, stop here. Yes. Can I do something about it? Yes or no? No. Stop worrying about it. Yes. Okay. Have I done the thing about it? And then it's just like, if you've done everything you can, you stop worrying about it. It's a really simple diagram. I love it. Yeah. 
basically the whole point uh, is to just stop worrying about it but isn't that exactly. such a tall order like control your <laughs> thoughts control your brain state go ahead try <laughs> yeah <laughs> it takes a lot well, of practice it's like do do everything that you can and then when the worry comes up keep telling yourself i've done everything that i can yeah um but if we all worry enough about ai don't you think it <laughs> don't you think it will do absolutely nothing <clears throat> um I'm curious what the crossover between AI and VR is though, as far as, um, so, okay, we talked about avatars and people uh, being able to interact digitally and go to digital parties. And then if AI is now a thing and now you don't know if you're interacting with an AI avatar or a real person, right. what do you think about that? Hmm really blur the line between what is uh you know what is another person and what isn't another person and i don't think i'm i don't mind that i don't really think that i would have a problem accepting an artificial intelligence as a person for example you know that seems totally natural to me having grown up with computers and interact with them every day i feel like yeah. a computer could have as much agency as i would and it wouldn't bother me at all where i know some people would be very uncomfortable with that Right. So you're coming at it from the angle of like, well, you know, if they can do that, then who's to say that they don't have as much right to be in that space as we do. Like once, once AI is its own sentient being, we should give it respect and not try to treat it as something other than ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. I'm imagining this, this is my horror scenario. So I'm in a digital (laughs) party and I think I'm talking to a really cool person you know, they've got all these interesting things about them. And I'm like, oh, wow, I'm getting to know this person who lives, you know, across the world. And then they like open up the trench coat and they're trying to sell me like pancake mix or a cell phone or something. Oh, <laughs> like, no. It's all just been an ad. <laughs> AI I, for the purpose of selling you something, they're gathering information about you and then <laughs> just kind of, oh, by the way, I have this available if you would like to purchase it. <laughs> mm, yeah, that's a little shady. But people do that too. I mean, I don't think that's, that's true. It's not an AI problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's just a, we're trying to sell too much stuff to people who don't need it problem. Yep. Uh, speaking of which, this is not something that people don't necessarily need, but if they want it, what do you think is the best gaming hardware available right now or are or, or going to be available very soon for VR? Uh, that's a great question. My personal favorite device to use right now is the Oculus Rift S. It is very lightweight. It fits nicely on your head. It's uh, nice and snug. You can move your face around a whole bunch and it doesn't move. The resolution is great. Um, it has inside out tracking, which means that it doesn't require external devices to tell it where in space your headset or your controllers are. Um, and it is a pretty simple Um, set up you just plug it in (laughs) and it's ready to go so it removes a lot of barriers to entry it's not terribly expensive Um, I think it was priced at 400 before maybe they sold out during the holiday season I might be confusing that with the quest which is also produced by oculus but that one is even more accessible because it doesn't require a fast as hell processor in a gaming computer it is self-contained the computer is inside the headset, which makes it a little bit heavier in the front, which is why I don't call it my favorite, but it is easily the most accessible. And I know that they did sell out of those during Christmas and probably have, or during the Christmas holiday and probably have raised the price at this point for the next batch of them. So probably around $400, $500 for this all-in-one device, which is a huge step up from throwing down 1800 for your gaming computer and your vive pro which is a badass headset and has really good resolution and does all the good things but it's bigger it's bulkier it has kind of external headphones it has this external tracking but that would have been my second choice outside of the newer oculus devices Mm -hmm. yeah it looks like the oculus quest is listed for 400 dollars, and um and the rift is a little bit more expensive right now is it in stock though? Cool. Yeah, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. I'm, not gonna, I'm not even going to pretend to buy it right now. I'm end up really buying it. Um, so that's the best hardware. And you were saying you 
if you're getting one of the other units, you actually need a gaming computer as well. But yeah, that's amazing to me that they can actually contain all the necessary hardware in the unit itself. I didn't realize that it had come that far. That's really cool. I wish I could tell you more about how the technology works, but I think it's basically like a cell phone computer. You just need a good internet connection and you can do all the same things. Yeah, so how good of an internet connection do you need? Is it like fiber or is it... That I'm unclear on. I mean, I don't have fiber at my house and you used the Quest, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was working well. Cool. I wonder if my country internet will be good enough. Um, oh. So one of the things that we talked about last week that I was really excited about, um, you mentioned that they're using VR to train new surgeons. And yeah. I thought that was really cool. And, you know, we both sort of had a moment of like, oh my God, I'd never thought about, or at least I had never thought about a new surgeon who's doing their first surgery and how nerve wracking that must be and how unlucky it is to be that patient at the same time. Yeah. So it makes perfect sense to me that VR is an awesome application for that. Um, do you know of any other professions that are starting to use this for education? Oh uh, yeah. Uh, aviation for example, has been using it for decades. Simulators have always been a part of training for people who fly airplanes. Um, yeah, recently I started learning more about how various, you know, the, the field of medicine is using it. Uh, I guess the, the one of the main reasons they started using VR to train surgeons is that cadavers are very expensive and they require a lot of storage space and energy for freezing and time for thawing and they can only be used one time. <laughs> So, and like, I learned that in the first pilot study run by the software company, uh, the name of it is Oso, O-S-S-O, and they found that first year medical students trained in VR were twice as proficient as their traditionally trained counterparts, which I found mind blowing. So uh, what other industries are catching on to this? Hospitality, uh, manufacturing, uh, mm -hmm. mechanical, like repair and building things. Um, like everything that you can think of has gotten like risk management, retail, mm -hmm everybody's got some way of training people in VR, even if it's just like their training video, but you're in and you're in it and you're interacting with it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I could really see, especially, you know, like uh, police officers learning different scenarios mm -hmm. where, you know, you're so tense and you need to go through that tension to get used to it. Um, where it might be a completely peaceful interaction or it could change very quickly to a life-threatening interaction. And how do you train someone on that? You know, that's such a tricky thing. Yeah, it seems like it would be far more advanced and more um, conservative than using paper targets and real bullets, you know, using digital targets and digital bullets. <laughs> yeah, and just being able to actually set up a realistic scenario mm -hmm. and, uh, and run through it like that. Um, yeah, the versatility of that beats everything that they've been doing hands down. I don't know that they're using it, but it seems like they must be. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so curious about what all of that development side looks like. I mean, it must be like a like a mad race between, you know, obviously you guys are in the game space and then there's this whole education and professional side of things too, which I guess parallels the game space. Do you, do you see um, very much like cross-pollination between those two sides, like building on each other's frameworks and things like this? I don't really know. I mean, I went to, uh, I went to an event in New York City a few years ago called Games for Change, and it seemed really education-focused. Um, but the games themselves didn't really seem like I don't want to insult anybody out there if they are one of those developers. Uh, games didn't really seem much like fun. They didn't really seem like things you would play for fun. Um, they really just seemed like training software. Gotcha. So one thing that we talk a lot about on this <laughs> podcast is psychedelics, and we've already touched on it a little bit. But I'm curious because I was sort of feeling like I was having a psychedelic experience with Sound Self. Okay. And are you up to date on all the stuff that's going on with MAPS? I am. We were lucky enough to take part in the Psychedelic Science Summit that happened here in Austin last month. Oh, cool. Tell me and about so that, I learned please. All kinds of wonderful things that are happening and how excited everyone is about the progress. I learned that the FDA is fast-tracking MDMA therapy for um, PTSD, 
they were calling it a breakthrough therapy, which means that they're rushing it through trials. Like they want to get this approved as soon as possible, which is wild, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I think they're in phase three of human trials, which is really close to the end. And uh, I guess after, um, after the adults get tested, they're going to go ahead and test some adolescents because if they're going to approve it for therapy, then they have to be able to say if it's good for use with children. Isn't that Man, exciting? Where, where were these studies when I was an adolescent? <laughs> <laughs> we had the woods. It's called the woods back in the day. Yeah, there's a ton of excitement around this. And ketamine therapy is already available in various parts of the country, including Austin. That's um, one and that I know blows I'm my aware. mind. What's that? I said, that's yeah. one that blows my mind. Like, I get the other stuff, but the ketamine one is like, oh my God, I never saw that coming as like a therapeutic thing psychotherapy assisted ketamine therapy so you, you'd really want a human there to process your experience with i think that's a key aspect of it mm-hmm. um i also happen to know that the first fully psychedelic clinic is going to open in austin and will experience features um sorry will experience or sorry will feature experiences created by andromeda oh cool i don't think i'm allowed to say their name though but they're coming <laughs> okay all right we'll keep it on the hush hush uh-huh. um so yeah, so you guys are paralleling that movement. So obviously there's some research that VR has some of the same properties and powers of psychedelics and uh, and meditation practice, but how is it different or what are what are some of the differences that you see? Um, d- differences between, between um, VR, VR, VR experiences like VR meditation and psychedelic drugs. Yeah. Well, yeah. For, for one thing, there's no commitment. If you start to get uncomfortable, you can just take off the headset. I <laughs> love that. That's great. <laughs> there's no um, uncomfortable come down period. Um, there is no other psychedelic experience you can pay for once and use infinitely <laughs> yeah. that exists in the world. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know if I told you about our clinical study of sound self. It's being run by a fellow named Jeff Tarrant, who's really well known for his research into psychedelic and meditative brain states. And he is using EEG data along with qualitative reporting um, to study sound self in comparison to psychedelics and an initial um, like EEG look at someone's brain while they were playing sound self showed um, exactly what you'd expect to find in a psychedelic experience. So we're not just blowing smoke here. <laughs> yeah. So, so you're saying no difference to the brain whatsoever. Like yeah, just, as far as your brain knows you're tripping out. <laughs> <laughs> that is so cool. I mean, to think that, I mean, a, like it just seems so much more advanced than like taking a substance and then having to like ride it out. Although I will say that like moving through that discomfort is sometimes an important part of the process, right? Or like, absolutely, yeah, it's like absolutely. the rite of passage. Um, yeah. But There's I guess no people, trial involved in this, right? Exactly. Yeah. But people can choose to be courageous and move through their discomfort with the VR as well. Yeah. I mean, I experienced discomfort with it, but it wasn't like, you know, ayahuasca discomfort where I was writhing pain and vomiting. <laughs> I was. I just felt awkward. <laughs> you guys think you'll eventually make a game that allows people to writhe in pain and vomit? Maybe. <laughs> you're going to steer clear of that one. Maybe. I mean, we have had people to talk to us that they're interested in recreating something like ayahuasca in VR, and I don't know what that would entail. Maybe it has some <laughs> sort of story involved where you go to a place and you meet a shaman and they take you into a dark hut and you pretend to drink tea and then a psychedelic thing happens that makes you nauseated. <laughs> That's mm. possible. I'm sure we could make you nauseous. <laughs> 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 I was I was kind of worried about that going into it. Um I get motion sickness like if I try to read in the back seat of a car or something like that while it's moving. Mm-hmm. Um so so yeah, as I was coming over to try VR, I was I was a little bit worried about that, but I didn't experience any really disorientation. It was like when I was in the VR, I was just reacting to it. Um have you ever experienced any motion sickness or anything like that? Yeah, it depends on the the um, movement mechanism in a lot of games. Like mm-hmm. if you're if you're allowed to like walk, like take steps, the way that that feels is really gross. Um, so a lot of games have a mechanic where you can like teleport from one point to another point, and that mm-hmm. totally fixes the problem. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So when you're actually taking physical steps, like in a situation where you've got a really big play space and you don't have cords on your headset, and you're actually moving around, like let's say you're playing in a like a huge gymnasium that will actually make you sick. No, 
Oh no, I'm sorry. I mean, if your avatar is just walking at a walking pace, as opposed to popping from one location to the next, that, that sensation of your avatar walking, if you're actually walking, then there's no motion sickness because you're physically moving. Oh, I get it. I get it. So when you're still, but you're like yeah. pressing a button to walk forward and you're just walk, like, like you're on a, like one of those flat escalators at the airport, <laughs> but it messes with your sense of motion because you're not actually moving. It, maybe something like that. Yeah. I know that if I have used, I've used the joystick in a couple of experiences instead of uh, using the, the jump to of location method. And it definitely makes me feel ill immediately. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Try to avoid that. Yeah, it was interesting when I was playing um, when I was playing the game where you're dancing. Audio trip. Audio trip. I'm sorry, I'm having such a hard time remembering that game name. Sorry. Um, yeah, I had physical reactions to there would be like a wall that comes at you, and you told me kind of a, a way to make it easier. You can just move your hands and your headset because that's all that's being sensed. Yeah. And when I would do that. I, I would still flinch when the wall was like hitting my body, you know, like it was hard for me to, to get relaxed about that. <laughs> like yeah. I felt like I really had to get out of the way. You take, it takes a while to get used to it, but eventually it just doesn't bother you anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that they'll make, um, like I was thinking when I was there, it'd be cool if the floor moved so that I could stay in this smaller play space, but walk around more. Um, or do you yeah, think they'll have bigger play spaces? There's a couple of different companies that are working on stuff like that. There's one that's kind of, I can't remember the name of either of them. I apologize to your listeners for being a shitty source of information, but there's like one that's shaped like a bowl (laughs) that you use like with your socks and you kind of, you can walk, but you just slide around on it and it feels like walking. (laughs) That sounds awesome. (laughs) And then there's another one that's like an omnidirectional treadmill. So it senses your location and kind of reacts to you so that no matter where you step, you're going to be in the center of the treadmill. And that's uh, not something that I find necessary at all because, you know, I don't really want to go anywhere. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't want to play. I'm not personally into playing games where I feel like I need to run around in big spaces or whatever. I'm not into shooters or stuff like that, but, mm-hmm. but I can see why it would take off if they became, uh, you know, affordable. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's this idea of being able to go to a digital experience of any sort and actually physically act out fully whatever's happening. Yes. That I think is kind of appealing and, and sort of very brings good. it to that next level. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, very compelling. Yeah, and I think the the exercise component of, of it is really exciting to me because I spent so much time just sitting on my ass playing video games. And I think I would have been infinitely healthier had I been playing games that actually gave me real exercise. So I'm excited for for kids who are going to grow up with this. I mean, on one hand, I'm like scared for them because it's so like, you know, I'm growing up with Tetris over here and I'm still addicted to video games. And these kids are going to grow up with (laughs) these amazing games, but they're actually going to be getting exercise while they do them. So it's like kind of excited and a little bit like, oh my God, I hope people don't just spend their whole lives in VR now. I think it's a distinct possibility that some people will. I think en- enough people are already never leaving their computer screen that it's, you know, that it's probably going to happen to some people. Before. Yeah, and that that's a good point though that um you know, shit we're already spending all this time just staring at a screen in our hand or in front of us on our computer we might as well just actually have a more immersive experience we're going to do that anyway. Yeah. Um, but then again, if the games can help us have more mindfulness, you know, that ultimately will help us to manage our own addictive tendencies. So maybe, yeah. maybe you guys can help balance it out. That's kind of the idea that hopefully people who are subscribed to all kinds of virtual experiences will also be subscribed to mindful virtual experiences to help them mitigate that possible issue. Yeah. Hmm. So I feel like I'm wrapping up on my questions, but I want to learn more about Andromeda and what you guys are working on. Do you have any new titles or um, ideas that you're super excited about that are coming in the future? Yeah. All of, I mean, all of them are really exciting. Um, all of our titles are new. <laughs> Audio Trip, which is currently in early access, like I said, through Oculus, uh, Vive, Index, uh, and on or Velvet, sorry, Vive and Velvet Index and on Steam. Um, and then, so SoundSelf is not released yet, but it is um, in a closed 
beta. So if you wanted to join our Discord and play sound self and give feedback on that, it doesn't actually require a VR headset or, or any of the other stuff. You really just have to have a pretty good graphics processor to run it and you can play it on your computer screen. Um, so that's that's the the only other one that we're publishing, but we have relationships with several other games that we just want everyone to know about and we'll take them to shows and show them to people. Um, for example, Deep VR is mm. another meditative experience. It's a breath-driven thing and you just breathe and you get to explore a, this surreal underwater world that's super beautiful just using like a presence with your breath. Uh, so another one is Microdose VR, which is being developed by the Vision Agency, which is uh, an artist Android Joneses and his team. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is like a deeply psychedelic flow game where you paint in the environment with these mind-bending animated forms that are just set to this awesome soundtrack. And it feels really freeing and exhilarating. Definitely psychedelic. <laughs> just, I just read about that game. Microdose. Like, right before, yeah, Microdose. Right before doing this podcast, I was reading Stealing Fire. Yeah. Uh, by Stephen Kotler. And I was like, wow, that sounds really cool. So I'm glad you mentioned it. Yeah. Uh, what else do we have? We have Cards for Connection, which is not even a video game uh, created by an Austin local. Her name is Erin Hickok. And uh, this is like a, a card game that's like, it's like her in antithesis to Cards Against Humanity, where it inspires heart opening, genuine human connection. I love it. <laughs> Take it to mm -hmm. parties, have people play it, and everyone loves it. Uh, and then there's another one that's. It's a technologically assisted flow game. It's called Group Flow. It was created by a guy, Mikey Siegel. You may have heard of him, founder of Consciousness Hacking. Hmm. Um, and this is kind of a system of wires and lights that I find very confusing and have not played with yet. But people have really amazing, amazing connective experiences with these because it um, connects you to other players' biofeedback and creates like group, group cohesion, even just between two people. But it can work in large groups of like up to 20 people. Yeah, I think so I read about this on your website. Like you can hear each other's heartbeats. Yeah. That's yeah. so cool. Yeah. And then you can hold a little bit of a little bitty light in your hand and it pulses to the rhythm of your heart. And then you can like hand your heart to another player and they can feel your heart beating in their hand mm -hmm. and watch the light glow. Yeah. Uh, so like... if you if you wanted to follow us on social media, it's at Enter Andromeda, or you can sign up for our newsletter on our website, www.enterandromeda.com. Cool. And you mentioned a Discord. Is that like a forum server type of deal? Yeah, it's a it's a little bit like Slack. I don't know if everybody use the workspace Slack. It's kind of set yeah. up that way, but it's mostly just for teams to talk about stuff. And it's, yeah, it's totally open. How do you find our Discords? That is a good question. Um, <laughs> I like that it's called Discord, though. Yeah. If People you go to enterandromeda.com and go to the titles section, there is discords for sound self and audio trip listed at the top of those pages. So if you want to join up, that's how you do it. Cool. So you can give some feedback about those experiences. Yeah. One thing that I forgot to mention about sound self that I thought was really neat was it was reacting specifically to the tones that I was making. So if I went more high pitched, it was um, the lights would change and the, the sort of feedback that I was getting from the game and the haptics felt very different than what I would tone low. And so it actually felt like I was playing an instrument that also generated visual feedback. And it was a really, really both fun and also like, uh, satisfying experience yeah it's so unique in that way that it can be fun and uh, stimulating and calming and it's, yeah it's pretty amazing i'm glad really glad you enjoyed it and got a chance to come over and try it yeah thanks for letting me try it i felt like i was getting like a free futuristic arcade experience um, so that was really <laughs> fun and uh and yeah i can't wait to try some more and i'm i'm really excited about the um the game that you just mentioned with the biofeedback and I'm just thinking about like when I get into an argument with someone or when you know I'm, like there's a rub and we're kind of butting heads about something if I could actually like hear that person's heartbeat and like hear their state changing into more of like a distressed like uncomfortable place I feel like I would be so much more empathetic yeah. instead of being focused on the idea of whatever the rub is it's like oh there's a person here in front of me like that comes first. Yeah. That's, it reminds me of something a couple friend of mine 
couple friends of mine told me they do if they have a really intense disagreement they take all their clothes off and lay so their skin is touching on their side <laughs> and continue the fight while they and touching each other's skin <laughs> and it helps a lot <laughs> yeah I've, I've actually heard um a couple yeah i've heard that recommended as well like naked arguing um and uh, it's funny because it's so like when my hackles are already up, it's the last thing that I want to do. Like, you know, you like have even just like a little bit of physical contact. Cause I'm so like uh, just, yeah, it's like hard for me to relax into something like that. But that is the state change that you need to stop being an asshole. <laughs> you know, but it's like so hard. It's so hard sometimes. Precisely. Yes. Be vulnerable and allow connection, even though you're upset and you will feel less upset. It's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm so excited for just knowing that you guys are out there. I love knowing that there's groups of people, teams of people working on things from interesting angles and kind of gives me hope for the world that, uh, that you guys are doing what you're doing. So thank you. Yeah. And thank you for doing what you do. We know we talk a lot about systems and synergy and boy, I cannot wait until you can take an augmented reality device out into a client's yard and put their headset on them and let them walk around in the design you've created for them. That's just around the corner. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. I've been spending a lot of time this week staring at two-dimensional designs. And if I was actually like creating the reality in in VR or AR, that would make me so happy. So thank you yeah. for being a part of that transition. That's going to be amazing. Yeah, I can't wait to see what you come up with. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Heather. Well, I look forward to talking to you again soon and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. It was a pleasure. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Hey guys, this is Wes, your host and producer of the Edge Zone podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, Mike and I love putting these episodes together and having these discussions, and we would love to hear from you. So if you have a question or a comment, please reach out to us at contact at edgezonepodcast.com or you can join our Facebook group, Edge Zone Podcast on Facebook. We will do some episodes where we field your questions and we are really looking forward to hearing from you. Also, you can help us out by spreading the word. If you like the show, leave us a rating, subscribe, post comments on our YouTube channel and let your friends know if this is something you think they'd be interested in. And again, thank you so much for listening.